Um, I just want to welcome you all to the Artist Outlook video series. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm the curator at the Appleton Museum of Art, and we are thrilled to have with us this evening internationally recognized photographer Juliet Van Otteren. A special treat. She has lots of fabulous stories, so I will introduce her briefly and let her talk a bit about herself. Juliet, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone, please? I, um, if I freeze up, it's because we have a really bad bandwidth here in this area and I'm going in and out of being frozen. So um, I'm Juliette Van Otteren. I've been taking photographs. I started at eight or nine years old and uh, I didn't know it was going to be my profession. It was in the Himalayas that I fell in love with portrait photography and the amazing faces that were available to me then. That's when I realized I wanted to do this more seriously. Wonderful, thank you. And um, I just wanted to reiterate, um, we appreciate your patience this evening. Um, Juliet's having some bandwidth problems in her home. So uh, we can hear where she's actually called in on her phone. So we're, we're hearing her voice via her phone but we're watching her via the internet and it might freeze up a little. So we, we appreciate your patience this evening with the process. It's always interesting on Zoom. <laughs> but I would like to start off um, by talking to you, Julia, a little bit about your influences. Now you had mentioned briefly that you sort of became more serious about photography in the Himalaya. Would you like to talk a bit about your journey that sort of led to that and kind of elaborate a little bit, please? I went to university in Los Angeles and uh, studied sociology and philosophy and became very interested in the Eastern philosophies. And then I went to, um, I went to the, the Himalayas and Nepal and I spent a year studying Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism and Sanskrit. And I learned to meditate and still meditate. And I <clears throat> feel it gave me a, not only a deeper knowledge of myself, of course, but of any subject that I photograph. There's, there's an energy about a person and I can go right into that. And it enables me to capture some extraordinary photos. Even the people I photograph say they never saw that aspect of themselves. Peter Singer said that. He said, oh, I don't, I said, I'm going to photograph your soul. And he, he, um, he said, well, yeah. and I said, I know I've read it. I've read some of your work and I know you don't believe in that, but that's okay. I'll photograph it anyway. And then I'll make a print and I'll show it to you, which is exactly what I did. And I met him a month later in, in New York city and sh showed him the print. And he was very casual. And he looked down and he took a double take and he said, I've never seen him. That is amazing. He gave me a beautiful quote for my life website so um it all it has always worked and um i i credit that base much more than any classes in a photography school could have taught me i yes i had to learn how to take photos i had to learn how to print but that's just the technicals and i don't think that's the most important part of photography. It's something you need to do, but once you learn it, and I could go in a dark room and uh, well, I got the camera, the Hasselblad I used was an extension of my soul. That's how I felt. I, knew, I just knew it was. And it wasn't this, this box. It, it was just me. It was, and, and it reached out. And in the dark room, I was alone, which is very different from photographing people, which is my most of my career. And in the dark room, I, I became immersed in, and I never thought of what I did in the dark room. It became natural, the way I used my hands. And then when the Tate um, Gallery Museum in London, uh, they had a piece that the, um, they had curator Sean Rainberg wanted to take in permanent collection before they had any photography. And he said, I want you to write an artist statement why photography is art. And I wrote this statement about painting with my hands because that's what you do. You, you keep light off, you put light on. I, I never printed color, I print 
black and, black and white silver jaw. And it was amazing because I could change the energy and the feeling of the photograph by letting light on and taking it off. And I loved that. And um, I'd work for hours in the dark room. I actually miss it. I realized that yesterday. Hmm. Interesting. I and we'll, we'll chat more about that a little bit later because I think that is also kind of pertinent to further down the line why you why you aren't currently in the dark room. I think that's an interesting story too. So it sounds like you didn't really have, correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't really have any other photographers who influenced you. Is that correct? Uh, there are photographers that I admire, but they're, they're I love Ansel Adams' work. His black and white work is stunning and it's nature and I love nature. And um, Mary Ellen Mark was, was one of the first women photojournalists that um, was well known and she, she got incredible images and uh, I liked her work. And then Cindy Sherman always does self portraits and it, it, I became interested in doing self portraits not the way she does them it's very different what she does but the way i felt i wanted to capture myself that to communicate you have some of those on powerpoint yes yeah. well yes we'll see some of her self-portraits um when i get to the powerpoint slides in a bit mm -hmm. wonderful so it sounds like oh go ahead go ahead so, uh and also, as controversial as he is, I, I did admire Robert Mapplethorpe's work. I think he's probably the most brilliant black and white printer, especially of um, uh, the human form of, of anyone. And I, that's how I tried to do my, my, not what he photographed and his sensibilities, but the, the black and white was just, you know, it was so real. And, um, and I love that. So that I guess that brings me to another question. When you first started photographing, did you start in black and white? Or did you go to color and then find the beauty of black and white? How did that work? Well, as a child, of course, I used color in my little Kodak box camera, you know, I mean, I was taking pictures as a kid. Um, <clears throat> But when I started, and then when I first started taking pictures in Nepal and India and the Himalayas, I was using uh, color film. I didn't think of any. And then when I then when I seriously started to get into photography, um, I went to photography school for a very short time to learn the technicals. I didn't actually learn them there. I learned them once you get in the dark room. You you learn them. But um, that's where I became really immersed in black and white. And I never did color for many years. Okay. And it was in, in Austin, I started to shoot some color and they'll be on the PowerPoint you know, too. And, and they're um, more of an abstract type. Mm -hmm. So um, what did you have an, I'm look, talk, still talking about process because some artists have expressed they sort of had an aha moment what did you have an aha from taking pictures of cute children and interesting people that you saw there to oh my gosh i really want to do this seriously did somebody tell you hey you've got it pursue this or was it just sort of a self aha what what how did that work i don't think there was there certainly wasn't just one moment um some of the people that told me I, I had this gift um, that did impact me because one of them hated me for it. So like, he was complimenting me. He, he hated me for it. He said, you have this incredible gift and you don't even appreciate it. Um, and then I had a professor who said, if I, if I could do what you do, I wouldn't be here. It's simple. That's what he said. And that, that probably had a quite an effect on me. Okay. Because I, I felt I felt sad that he that he felt that way about his work, but it was it 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 really had a powerful effect on me positively. 
So Whereas my boyfriend who hated me for it. That that was it was he was an incredible photographer, but he said what you have, I've all I've wanted that my whole life. And I'll never have what you have. And and it was um it was a bit strange. Um, and my husband said to me recently, I, in fact, people have said this to me, when I'm doing shoots, it's like I'm so immersed in the energy and what's happening, I don't shoot like a normal photographer. And I had one very wealthy client in Manhattan. Um, I, he flew me over, I was living in England at the time, and he flew me over to New York. So I had to hire, you know, rent lights, and, and I had my cameras, but I had to rent lights and everything, and rent an assistant, and we're doing this shoot in his um, house in um, Sutton Square in Manhattan, and uh, he said to my assistant, does she know what she's doing? <laughs> my assistant said, I have no idea. I've never met her before. I've never worked for her before. <laughs> So um, I heard him say that, but it, it didn't phase me. I just carried on. And he loved the photo. So, but so, it's not apparent because I don't have this, um, this way of working where it's very systematic and technical. And, you know, and I like rolling my own film, too. I don't like an assistant to just hand me back and just slam them on the, you know. When you're working commercially, it's difficult because they want you to do a lot of film. It doesn't matter if you've got it in the first roll. I know when I get it, but it, when they're paying you a lot of money, they want to get their money's worth. So you have to keep shooting. Mm -hmm. And also they pay for the models and they want to make use of them. So th then you went to school briefly and then did you go straight to commercial or, or did you start contact using contacts and getting access because I mean I want to those of you I'm sure most of you know that are watching but sh if you name a famous person Juliet Van Otteren has photographed that person <laughs> she has done some amazing work with luminaries of stage screen science you name it so I guess I, I guess one of my questions is how did you get that entree because obviously those people you can't necessarily just walk up to them and go hi how did you, how did it go about for you to become in those people's orbit in order for you to get their images? Well, I did commercial work in Manhattan, which I worked really hard to break into. That was to survive. And I started doing well. And I wasn't photographing literary people or, you know, I wasn't looking to do that. And then when I immigrated to England because I wanted a peaceful life and I couldn't didn't deal with the whole um, Madison Avenue thing anymore. So I moved to England and um, went to visit the curator at the National Portrait Gallery and showed him um, some photographs I'd done in New York of Kathleen Rain, Ramundo Panikkar. They're not, they're famous in intellectual circles or in poet circles. They're not famous like Stephen Hawking. So he loved them. He bought them. And then he, he started suggesting people that I photographed that he could collect for the National Portrait Gallery. And one of them was Stephen Hawking. He said, I have a lot of photographs of him, but what, I know you'll do something different. Well, that was my entree in, because I called and of course, you know, he has assistants, a lot of them. And I said, the National Portrait Gallery would like me to photograph um, Professor Hawking for their collection. Well, he's very busy and he can only give you 15 minutes. I said, oh, that's fine, I can do it in 15 minutes. I never did a shoot in 15 minutes, but I mean, what else can I say? I knew if I had to, I would. Can I tell that story, Patricia? Yeah, but well, let's let's okay. wait the whole story until we get to the slide of him, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. And actually, this is probably a good time to move to the slides. Are you okay moving to the slides? Am I freezing? Am I freezing? Nope, you're I you're not freezing. I can okay. we can see Sorry. you. Okay, let's let's go to the slides. So bear with me while I share the screen here. Okay. So, and I want to uh, give a disclaimer, everyone, just so we're being above board. There is some nudity involved in some of her images. So I just want everybody to know that there will be some nude images. Okay. So talk to us about this wonderful self-portrait, please. It's two negatives put together and then enlarged. Um, 
and then and then printed. I they were taken at different times. In fact, um, the image on the left, my left, uh, that was taken in the early 80s, and then the one on the right was taken in 85. And then that date says 83. I don't, I must have gone by the first image because the second one has been taken yet. Anyway, then they were put together, and I really love the effect. I find it very introspective and and um, thought provoking. It still gives me pause for thought when I look at it. Sort of the two selves of you, or oh, I have many more than two, but <laughs> yeah. those are two different aspects for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we have another self-portrait. Would you like to tell that us about- was taken at the same time as the image on the right in the previous. It was the same sitting or within two days. Um, that was taken in a, a, in a loft I was sharing with five other artists underneath the Williamsburg Bridge in uh, Brooklyn. So when you when you were taking this, did you have the plunger, the remote in your other hand? How did you how did you go about taking this self portrait? It's in my arm that you where you can't see it. I later got the automatic. Um, but this at this point I had the plunger. You're absolutely right. I used the plunger. So there's always some appendage that isn't showing. Sometimes I use my knee or my toes. In this case, it's my right hand. Okay. Then this wonderful one. This is a triptych. It's one of, of the triptych of um, that I created. I was um, trying to get into a very prestigious show called Women Regard Men, the Male News. This was in 1985. And they had 20 spaces available. It was a fabulous gallery in Soho, a huge gallery. And they had two spaces still available for artists. So they put out in the art news um, that there, there was a spot for two additional artists so you could apply for it. So I, I photograph I made this triptych and I submitted it and I was one of the two artists uh, that was taken in with some very well established famous women artists so it's a great <coughs> opportunity and it was the kind of opening that um you know that the limos come and the New York Times reviews it not me but they reviewed other people who were in the exhibition and uh it was it was very exciting I loved it it's my entree into the art world in New York, which is very exciting. That's wonderful. One of the things I really like about this piece in particular is you've got such nice juxtapositions and obviously your lighting is just to die for. You've, but I, I wanted to draw everyone's attention. I mean, I love how you've got the, the tension of the veins versus the very smoothness of a shoulder. I mean, it's, it's a lot of really interesting contrasts with textures, obviously light. I think that's really quite wonderful. Did you, did you pose him intentionally to do that or was some of that a happy accident? I posed him because this is a, this is a yoga posture and um, well, it's not a full on yoga it's, it's, he's. I'm starting to put him into the spinal twist. The spinal twist wouldn't have looked as nice. So I started him in the twist and then the arm where you're commenting on the vein, it's in an angle that I, where I like the composition. It wasn't, um, yeah, I posed him. <laughs> well, it's, it's really wonderful. Now, and you know, um, some a lot most of your models too isn't that true you you know you actually have you know friends or relationships with these people he's been a close friend for um 
since 1985 when I met him. He's still a good friend. It, it, one of the kinds of friends that you can call up when you need something, you know, and they're there for you always. And um, he's in New York. Where, I mean, he's a cyber computer guy and um, that's always been his career. So he stays in, in Manhattan, but um, we've always stayed in touch. Let's go to the next image. Very beautiful. Um, Do you want to tell us a bit? Oh, yeah. it should, should I say the museum they're in? It, it, does it not matter? I'm sorry? Did I mention the museums that sure. have these? Or, or no? sure. okay. um, the previous one is, is the whole triptych is in the Brooklyn Museum in New York. And this one is in the Museum of Modern Art and in Nice. And I don't, know, I don't remember. I don't always remember where they are. But um, I have many photographs of Beata. I met her, um, we were both activists to get the whales and dolphins out of the tanks and the performing rings in the UK. And it is banned there now, it's been banned for years. And um, I was sitting at a meeting waiting for it to start and that she walks in and obviously she's a model, you know, it's, it's very clear. And she sat down, you know, next to me out of a lot of people in the room. And she looked at me and I said, um, you're a model. And she said, I said, I'm a photographer. And she said, yes, you must be the photographer that's going to photograph me and show me aspects of myself that I've never seen. She just said, that. and it's true. And we did a number of shoots together. I was living in the countryside outside of London and she would take the train down. And I loved working with her. And I printed her, on purpose, I printed her very high key on a black background because her hair was very black, her eyes were blue, and she just, and her skin was very, she's Canadian, and her skin's very pale, and I just love the contrast. Yeah, it's oh, very striking. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, love him. Now, now tell the story, please. <laughs> okay, okay, please. I don't want to freeze for this. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I, that was booked that I was going to get my 15 minutes with him. So I took the train. I had to take the train to London, change trains, and go up to Cambridge. So it took it took a couple of hours to get there. Of course, I had an assistant to carry all the equipment, it's heavy, the lights and the cameras and everything, and. Um, they told me to set up in a classroom. They showed me where I could set everything up. So um, I did that. And uh, then I waited and I waited and I waited. I've never been kept waiting, <clears throat> excuse me, an hour like that. And uh, I was very annoyed that I was kept waiting so long. And then I hear his wheelchair coming down the corridor. And he turns the corner and our eyes connected. And I just knew. I knew this man and he knew me. It was just this very powerful experience for him too. And uh, so he comes in, you know, and he sets himself up and everything. And I start photographing and um, he's very great to work with. And then all of a sudden he stops the shoot and he, he had his voice activated box. And he said, have you read my book? And everyone, he had a, quite a, uh, entourage with me. And I said, yeah, I bought your book. Now I was going to read it on the airplane on my way to visit my parents in California for Christmas. Everybody breaks up laughing. Um, my assistant didn't because he hadn't obviously read the book. There is no way you need at least, I mean, his assistant told me later who had two PhDs in astrophysics, um, that he struggled to finish the book. So when people say, oh, I love your book, I mean, I read it, you know, he just, he's very nice to most people, he doesn't say anything, but it's, it's pretty intense. So um, then he said, no more photos to you finish reading the book. Okay, so we laughed and I carried on. 
in the meantime, I had I had a friend doing a doctorate at King's College, Cambridge, not the same, it was um, not the same department Professor Hawking was in. But, you know, at the college people talk and he apparently had fallen in love with his nurse. And my friend William told me about this. So I was just hoping that that's the nurse that was on duty that day with him. It's pretty obvious when they both came in the room together that that was that nurse. So I took a huge risk when I said, Professor Hawking, would you, would you mind if I photo took a couple of photographs with your friend? He looked at me really intensely and he, he asked I could do that. And with, with a great privilege and I made prints for him and his friend and I, it, I took them to him and I went back to see him. So this is, so I went back a few weeks later with the black and white of Professor Hawking and the prints of his friend. And um, they put me in his office this time. So he sits in his wheelchair, of course. So I'm behind his desk sitting in a chair. It was amazing. His, he had only everything in the office, no pictures of the queen and famous people, all pictures of animals running free. They were amazing. Two pictures of, of a person, both of Marilyn Monroe. One on the back of the door when the door was shut, when his assistant shut the door to go and let him know I was waiting for him. The one of Marilyn where she's like this, looking absolutely amazing and vulnerable and gorgeous. And then the other one behind the desk is the one from, still from the movie where her she's over the, the bench in New York and her dress is going up and she's laughing. Gorgeous. So he comes into the his office and um, I show him the print. And he gave me a quote from my website about a year later saying it was his favorite photograph anyone's ever done of him. And we talked and he used his box and it was, I was with him for 25 minutes. So I left and years later, years later, this was 1990 or it says 91. So I guess it was 91. Um, and then in 2000, I don't know, 2000 or 2001, I was photographing Alan Lightman in Concord, Massachusetts. Alan Lightman is also an astrophysicist, and then he crossed over into literature and became a literary, a literary legend and wrote on sunscreen and all that. But he was at this meeting of actors. When I told him I photographed Professor Hawking, and then I took the photographs to him, and I told him the date, he said, you're the reason he left us? He said, he told me he left all these astrophysicists just sitting in the room for 25 minutes. And they didn't know why he left them sitting there, but they waited. I thought, what a tiny world, you know? Here I am photographing Professor Lightman, and, and he was one of the people that was with Professor Hawking when I took the photo. So. That's really cool. And it came I'm, full circle. I don't, I'm only sorry that I didn't go back to London, to photo, uh, Cambridge, to photograph him again because he said I could. I, I, I missed that. Mm. Okay. That's a wonderful story. And it is, it is, I like, especially in this one, how you're clearly very focused on his eyes and you, it's a very, very tight shot. And you're, you're clearly really kind of looking and trying, I think maybe even trying to see what he sees. Is that a correct? I could never see what he sees, Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> That was very clear when I struggled with the book. Um, I think for me, the eyes, it was the connection that we had. I wasn't, certainly wasn't thinking of his book when I focused on his eyes. They just have an, an extraordinary clarity, of course, but also very, a, a spiritual depth, even though I think at the end of his life, he said, there's no God or something, but I, I don't care what he said. I, I know what I felt and I know the connection. That we have. That's lovely. Okay, let's move on. So now here we are not doing 
humans, and here we've taken a bit of a turn. Do you want to discuss that? There is a Buddha here. That's a Buddha in the corner. Right down here? Yes, that dark is, is, is the, um, a Buddha. OK. Um, they just, these flowers, we have them in our house, and they just spoke to me, and they just seemed to come more alive as they became closer to the end of their time. And uh, my husband said to me, you know, if you don't photograph them today, they're going to drop their petals. And um, I gently moved them and I used my backdrop and my light. And I just love it. It makes me feel very happy when I look at this. And I do love working in color sometimes. Was it any one? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Was it any one? Well, I'm not going to say any one thing because I already know better than that. What I guess what I'm going to say is what took you back to color? Because you'd been in black and white for quite a while. What took you back to color? I created an image which you have in the exhibition called Snow Horse. And it was Uther, who I did so many black and white photos of. And it was also, we were living in Connecticut at the time. And I was outside with my camera and I photographed a snow bank with a branch with a tiny bit of color. And when I saw the image after the film was developed, it, it really spoke to me. I thought it's very, very moving. So then we put that image together with the black and white. So it looks like Uther is coming through the, the snow. And I began photographing. Um, I have quite a few in that series. Uh, Winter into Spring is the, the for Cynthia moving across. And then you have all the snow still there on the branches. And um, I don't know. I can't. I can't actually give you a very comprehensive answer to that. Other than I just felt like working in color. It spoke to me. Okay. Maybe it's because I. Maybe it, you know. I'm wondering if it could have something to do with living in the countryside. Because in New York, it's never. New York's always so colorful and wild and alive. And Connecticut was very quiet. And in the winter, it's all black and white. There isn't any color. So maybe I was craving it, and uh, I don't know. You're making me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have another piece to contemplate. So this oh. fun little fellow. So now we're doing we're doing animals. My publisher, who published Heart of the Horse, asked me to do the same thing that I did with horses, with dogs. In other words, photographing them very different from anyone the way anyone else had photographed them. So I was working on the dog book, and this was one of the subjects that came to, to our house in um, in my studio, and I photographed I photographed a lot of dogs. That's how we got our first American Bulldog rescue, and um, it was. One, my husband named this Churchill because it just made him think of Churchill on that profile. Very cute. Oh, and that's another interesting thing. You had mentioned that Ian, her, your husband, Ian, often titles your work. He titled most of the book of the photos in Heart of the Horse. Which He's is very fun. good at that. He's a writer. So he, it's, it kind of, I think it's second nature for him to do that. Well, we'll see some images of the heart of the horse very soon. But here, so we're in 2004, so we're progressing through. Now we're in 2006 with abstract number nine. I became fascinated with photographing koi in ponds. We were living in Austin, Texas at the time, and so many people had these amazing ponds. And, uh, you never knew what you were going to get because they're they're alive and they're moving. They never hold still, 
and uh, I love all the juxtaposition of the shapes and the colors. And I had a lot of fun creating this series. And I was bitten by a brown recluse that day. I, oh, I didn't even notice because I was so into the, the photographs, I didn't notice. And thank God we had Texans coming over for dinner that night. And they, they looked at my leg and they said, you have to go to the emergency room. That's a brown recluse. Oh my goodness. But I didn't even notice because, because they, it's, it's, it's just, they're so alive. I, I love, I love all nature, but I especially love the, the koi and the ponds and you see them moving. So when you, this, speaking oh, of, I'm, oh, Gloria, I'm sorry. No, please. Speaking of series, when you do series, do you just, do you have a standard number you like to do? Do you just do what feels right? Talk to us about how you do your series. How do you know when it's good? I think I do it as long as I'm feeling I'm capturing something unique then I mean I don't have anything against doing this again if I ever have a pond um, I really enjoyed it but I felt I was going to other people's ponds because I didn't have a pond I can't really answer that Patricia because I don't have a, a set time where I'm going to do 24 and uh, it just sort of, I mean, I never did any more flowers, which that was a one-off, whereas this one turned into a series. Okay. I think that's interesting, too, that the flower was a one-off. So now we get to the beautiful horses. <laughs> so we're backing up in time, as I'm sure all of you are watching um, have noticed. So this, this is a 2003 work so the, and I think the story behind all of this is wonderful so if you could please tell us the story behind your horse photography I was commissioned by a woman to photograph her with her Frisian stallion at a barn in Northampton Mass. we were living in Connecticut at the time and most of my work was done in Manhattan or sometimes I went to Princeton for different authors or um, yeah, yeah, or wherever, but usually I would be going to New York. So going up to Northampton Mass to this barn was very different. And I did the photograph. And while I was doing it, she said, the, um, that the owner who had owned most of the Andalusians in the barn, the owner's uh, favorite horse is dying of malignant melanoma. And um, she would like you to take a photograph of Uther. So I said, I love horses, I love animals. So of course I said, yes, I would do that. And then I asked the owner to, to be in the photograph with the horse that she loved so much. She said, oh no, I'm not, I'm not the rest for it or made up or anything. And I said, it's okay, it's about your connection with him. It's about the energy. And um, so she agreed and she stood there and I took the photo. And I sent her a print and um, she wrote to me and she said, I graduated with my degree in art from the University of Pennsylvania, but I never believed photography was art until I saw what you captured between Luther and me. And you are welcome to come back anytime and photograph the horse. So I did. I, we drove up and um, I first photographed that, that same horse, the white horse, Luther. And he was in a stall because I hadn't set up the the backdrop and like for this photograph here with the Thunderbolts. And this was the first photo I did of her horses that I was just taking a picture of them without any people or bridles or saddles or anything. So it was in a stall and we hung up my white velvet backdrop that we used for people. And we had the two lights in that stall and um, and I wanted Uther to do the pee off because it's a very interesting move. And um, I asked the owner if he could pee off. And she said, well, not unless I'm on him. And she thought this woman must be an idiot. She can't know what she's talking about. So I did it and Uther did it. I mean, he was trained to do it, but he 
knew what I was doing and we had this amazing connection and so he just did it. In fact, every time I walked in the barn over the next year and a half when we would go up there and I'd take pictures, as soon as I walked in the barn, he'd start doing the pee off like that. Fabulous. And that's, that's a specific foot movement, correct? Yes, it's, uh, uh, they're very collected and their head is very tucked and they um, pick up their feet in a certain way. It's like dancing in place. Okay. I guess that's the way to put it. Okay. Well, this is pretty... Natural. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, this is uh, to my, I mean, I love horses, but I'm not as familiar uh, with them. And I, I know you've been around them since you were little, since you were five, correct? Yes. So when I see this, you're very close to an extremely large animal that is only up on two legs. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's a bit intimidating to me. Can you kind of describe what was going on in this image? Oh, Patricia, I, I was in ecstasy. I, I had no fear. I, I, um, the only thing I ever fear are humans, never an animal, even poison snakes. Um, I'm using uh, a 150 width, which I was using the Hasselblad equivalent of the portrait lens on the Nikon. So in other words, it's very close. So when he's rearing, it looks like he's quite far back, but he's basically rearing almost over my head. And if you look at the eye, he's looking right into the lens. There was such a connection, it was, it was gorgeous. And uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. And I'm glad you put it in the PowerPoint. It's, okay. it's stunning. Let's look at some more images. Now, this one is from the show and it's, uh, it's adorable. Do you wanna talk about these people two? Love, yeah, people love this. Um, most of the prints of this are sold. And uh, they made a post. They made posters of this. It was a company that got the rights to make posters. And um, yeah, I really love this. Is it's is this cute. is this Uther? This horse on the left. Uther and the, and the one on the right is a scorial. Okay. Uther is a purebred Andalusian. A scorial is an Andalusian saddlebred cross. Okay, beautiful. And he's a very sweet. Face. Well, they're clearly friends. Oh, yes, but Uther, if you, if you look at his eye, Escorial is totally into Uther touching him and being, being sweet, whereas Uther is looking right at the camera. <laughs> you know. tell, the, tell the Uther story you told me about um, when, when he would pout. Oh, when yeah, fabulous. Okay. <laughs> to do the photograph, once I, I photographed Uther in the stall, um, then when I went back, I bought a backdrop from an opera company in, in New York. And we hung this backdrop up. She had a very big barn. She had a round pen where they were horses in the middle of it. And we hung the backdrop there. And I put my, I had used five strobes in different uh, places so that I could light them the same way I would light a person in the studio and used reflectors because they're much larger than the person, you know, and I wanted them to be completely lit. And then there was an opening about six or seven feet wide so that if they didn't want to be there to be photographed, they could go back to their stall, which was open. Um, no one ever left. And uh, when I was photographing Luther, the stallion, they were, they were stapled next to each other in the, in the barn. And the stallion would rear and scream and carry on. And when I was photographing the stallion in the ring, who's the horse that was over me rearing, that's regularly. Uther would stand with his head in the back and his head down like that in his bum facing the door pouting. He didn't like them. They were jealous. And of course, you could never put them together because Uther's a gelding and regularly says the stallion you won't put a stallion with another horse. Yeah, yeah. But there's a little sibling rivalry going on there for your attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> okay, let's take another image. This is also in your wonderful exhibition. And I, I love straight on because you just don't, 
you don't see composition like this very often with horses, at least I have not. So that's one of the things I think is so striking about this. I mean, you're photographing this horse as almost as you would a human, just, you know, straight on looking and you're, we're so used to seeing horses from the side or, you know, uh, at an angle from the back. So I think this is a really intriguing mm -hmm. image. Thank you. Um, I love your sensitivity to the images and it shows in the way you've hung the exhibition. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. He, he, he was, what? Um, he's very peaceful and uh, Some very famous collectors of uh, have have this photo. Wonderful. It's it it's really great. So that's it for the slides. Is there anything else you wanted to add or go back to before we stop sharing the slides? Oh. Okay. So we'll go back to I'm, oh I'm sorry. I want to leave time for people to ask questions. Okay. Okay, so um, there's two questions that I've always asked during this. And one, I know we're all sick and tired of talking about COVID, but it's, the answers have been really interesting because some individuals in all aspects of the arts that I've sp spoken to, in addition to on the Artist Outlook series, some creatives, when they were in lockdown and separated from people potentially, very much went in themselves and they didn't really create and they didn't really do their art so to speak they were just very in other people became producing machines and some other people of course are somewhere in the middle what what happened to you how did that affect your creative process or did it we were living on uh 23 acres in the middle of the marsh in Crystal River in a stilt house, which bordered on Salt River and our canal here and Port Island Trail that goes to the beach. It was an environmental paradise. So I took, I photographed more nature and I photographed flowers there. I forgot about that, but they weren't staged. They were natural. I had a pollinator garden photograph butterflies and yeah so I guess that's what I did I did nature which I really really love and nature relaxes me and uh that's what I did and I, I probably took a photo every day which is a lot I don't usually do that because you know I, I I set up for my photos so this was done with sometimes the nighttime but quite honestly usually with my iPhone and because I would have it in my hand and the icon's heavy and it does better with the tripod. And so I'm walking around the land and we had a quarter mile driveway and you never knew what you were going to see. I always wanted to see an alligator. I never did. The whole time Ian saw one alligator when he was driving out. In fact, he thought it was a fallen tree and then it stood up and walked up and it's like, oh, Juliet's missing this. Um, I love alligators. We had water moccasins. It's you know, there was never any problem. It was beautiful. And I loved taking pictures of nature, sunsets, sunrises, things I'd never really done. So didn't think of that until you asked that question. So let's go to, now you talked about process and, and inspirations and, but let's talk about the whole dark room thing. Um, you stated that you really just, you don't do dark room work anymore. Would you like to Talk about why. I spent so much time in the dark room uh, for years. It takes much longer to print than it does to take the photos, which is why most photographers, especially the ones who make a lot of money, they would never go in the dark room because it's not cost effective, to be really honest. Um, it takes a lot of time and it's also toxic and it was becoming more and more difficult to get the paper and they, they kept reducing what was available and after I finished printing for well, Heart of the Horse, of course, but then when I created the dog book, which I finished, um, 
And when I finished all those images, uh, no, actually, I still printed in Austin. I have a dark room, several of them, yes. I still printed in Austin because I had private commissions and I would print those. When we moved to Asheville in 2012, I didn't want Ian to build a dark room. I wanted to stop doing it. I needed a rest. We were there six years, and then there was no way I was going to put chemicals into the marsh in um, Crystal River. That wasn't even thinkable, even though I had silver collectors and all that. So it's only recently that I thought it would be wonderful to print again. But things are just not, you can't, I haven't looked into it, but I don't think you can get the paper. My gallery called me about a year ago and a collector wanted to order the, the nuzzle, actually, the one you just saw with the, that sweet picture, very large. And I said, Barry, they don't make the paper that size. And he said, but they want it and they'll pay a lot. The gallery is always thinking the money, you know, if they're going to pay, then you must be able to make it. I said, Barry, I can't create the paper. You can't, I, can, I just can't do that. They don't make it anymore. It's finished. So um, I am working on a book on tribal girls and um, I started it in Kenya. Um, it's how they, how they transform when they get an education. It's absolutely mind boggling how you, you photograph them when they've left the tribe and they're in a school and they're learning and, and what they have to go through to learn is not easy. It's not like we're so spoiled here, it's unbelievable. We take all these things for granted. I mean, they don't even have hot water. And they they really go through, it's a tremendous effort to get an education. But then when you photograph them in Nairobi and they're working and they have jobs, they're like, it's, it's blossom, it's fabulous. So I started doing that and that is in color. And it's digital, of course, so. Well, that'll be great. We look forward to seeing that. And I, I did want to mention too, um, the Juliet's exhibition at the Appleton Heart of the Horse is currently on view and it will be up until January 9th. And her book that she mentioned with the horses is also available at the Appleton. So if the great Christmas gift, got to get that in there <laughs> because the holidays are coming up very quickly. <laughs> So I have another question that I always ask everybody that I've had in the series. We are a proud campus of the College of Central Florida, and I wanted to know if you had advice to give people who are emerging artists or student artists who want to basically be you one day, who want to do this full time, what advice would you give them? They need to check in with themselves first and see if they are insanely passionate about the, the kind of art they want to do, because it's not easy. I, I can't think of, there isn't anything more rewarding when it goes well, when it works. The feeling I get when I'm photographing, it's usually I'm working with a person. I don't need to see the film. I get a feeling, it's just so powerful. And It's very rewarding. It's also very difficult. It's crazy competitive. It's probably the most competitive profession in the world, especially now that everyone's a photographer with an iPhone or any kind of, you know, a smartphone. Um, so there's this enormous competition and, um, but if you're really passionate, I think you should follow your passion. I started in ballet at five years old. I've always been in the art. And I didn't think about being an artist, you know. My father was a businessman. It's not something that I programmed. So if they really want to do it, they'll have to follow their, their passion. Otherwise, it's a bit empty, the life, isn't it? We're not doing what we want. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, everyone, I wanted to mention, too, um, we are at, taking questions via the chat function. So if anybody had questions for Juliet, something that we touched on that you want to learn more about, something we didn't cover that you want to learn more about, feel free to type in your questions in the chat and I'll read those to Juliet and we can ask the questions. So please feel free to do that. 
And I wanted to mention that um, Julia kind of touched on that, but she is also now a here in Florida. So we're very lucky to have her here. She doesn't, she doesn't live in Ocala, but she lives pretty close. So it's just lovely to have you here. And we feel very thankful that such a prestigious person is close by. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. We love the Appleton. It's a gorgeous museum. Thank you. And everyone in the area talks about how you've transformed it since you've come there. Oh, thank you. You bring interesting exhibits. No, they do. They say you bring in interesting exhibits. And um, it's it's really amazing. I, I, I find it ironic that I stopped riding years ago. And then I end up doing this book on horses. And then I end up in the horse capital of the world. Right next door. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have We have a question. Um, Gail, Gail asked, do you only work in film or have you ever used digital photography and a virtual darkroom? Yes, I've used digital photography and a virtual darkroom. Okay. Um, and, uh, Kenneth asks, have you ever photographed dancers? I was thinking I photographed myself, but yes, I photograph dancers. I would think they would be really not, fun subject. Not in a studio, not like going to the ballet in New York and doing it, but individual, uh, especially uh, girls who are just starting. I guess they remind me of myself a bit when I first started, and they're really precious to photograph. Um, Dave asks, I, going back to the digital, uh, Dave asks, do you post process your own images with Photoshop? I've never used Photoshop. There we go. Yeah, so all the horse, so I just want to go ahead. I'm sorry. Anything you see in the exhibition, in fact, all my black and white work, it's all done in the dark room. And I've seen people do Photoshop. It's I mean, once you learn Photoshop or Lightroom, it's much easier than spending hours in the dark room, you know, with the chemistry and the and the paper. But I'm I I'm not interested in doing that. Okay. Um, so someone asks for states and then asks, it sounds like you've lived in many different places in the world. How many, how much moving did you do? And was it because of business or other reasons? Wow. Oh. <laughs> I've lived in five countries, including India, Nepal, and um, the Middle East, France, and England. And um, 12 years of my life, I lived out of the United States. It was some of the richest time of my life. It, I think it's important to experience other cultures. When I met my husband, uh, who speaks four languages, I moved to France not speaking a word of French. And it was uh, revelatory. I mean, I, I had extraordinary experiences. And um, I think it's wonderful. And also living in different states, it, it's very different because California is so different from New York and, and Florida, they're all, and Texas is totally unique. And, you know, they're all very different. And I think it, it enriches us as a person. For me, it, it enriches me creatively to live in different environments where there's different thoughts and ideas and people react differently. I love moving. My poor husband, when I met him, he restored a, a a huge castle in the south of France and turns it into a cultural center. And um, that's how we met. He booked an exhibition of my work in 1992. And um, he'd never, he never thought he would leave. And, and then we, my mom wasn't well, so we went to California um, after I was in France for four years with him. And then we moved to California and we've been moving. And, um, we just bought another home. So um, we love doing houses too. And then you get to 
you get to put up your work and decorate and, and it's just fun. I don't know if he considers it fun yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the after you're there part, the moving part, the literally the moving part to me is not fun at all. Oh, no. but after you're there no, part's no, no. fun. <laughs> no, but we've got very good movers now. Excellent. Um, well, you've got an offer here. I have two beautiful Arabian mares if you're ever looking for some new subjects, which is fun. And then Dave says, thank you very much. Um, you're very interesting and your photos are superb. Um, let's see, I think that was most of the questions, but lots of thank yous, lots of you're just wonderful and they very much enjoyed that. So, well, I think it might be about time. Did you have anything else you wanted to add or talk about before we put a wrap on it? No, thank you for all the questions. It's always, uh, it's good for me to be, have questions and have to think about things. Well, I think it's very interesting. I mean, especially for people who don't create art. I think it's just very, like me, I'll be honest. I'm an art historian. I don't create art. I'm not an artist. So even for people like me who work with art every day, it's always fascinating to hear the thought process because every, obviously, every artist is different. So every rationale for why you do it is different. Every process that you do is different. So I think that's really quite fascinating to get into people's psyches and see why they do what they do. Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. Well, You're thank perfect. you so much. <laughs> Well, everyone, I want to say thank you so much for being part of the Artist Outlook. We have one more in the series on Thursday, December 16th. I am interviewing painter Susan Martin, and she is currently on view as well in our balcony gallery dedicated to Florida artists. Um, Susan is from Merritt Island, Florida. Very fascinating compositions. She does very intensely focused images of botanical pieces. So she'll really zoom in on, if you will, a specific part of a plant or a specific part of a tree and intensely paint that. So it's really wonderful. It's a beautiful show. We encourage you to get to the Appleton, of course, to see Juliet's. Juliet will be up until April 24th. So please do come by and see her show. Um, join us again, Thursday, December 16th for the next Artist Outlook. And we look forward to seeing all of you that can make it to the Appleton to please come by and experience this fabulous work. Because as I always like to say, virtual is wonderful and images via Zoom and whatnot are wonderful, but the impact of a, of a work of art in person cannot be matched. Mm -hmm. So we really invite you to come by if you possibly can and see these in person and feel the power of the art in live and right in front of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. I'm also giving the two tours on January 8th at 11 right. a.m. Thank you very much. Yes, Juliet is, she did two tours previously. She's going to be back by popular demand uh, January the 8th, which is um, on a free, free first Saturday. It's not literally the first because the first is New Year's Day and we're closed. So the free first Saturday has been shifted to January 8th and Juliet will be leading tours through her own exhibition, both at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So please join her for that. She's just fascinating. She'll take any questions that might've popped into your head that you might not have put down right now. Um, and we really appreciate you. Thank you for reminding me. And thank you so thank much. You. We really just thank you. love your work and love to have you. Okay, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.